Okay, welcome back. Good morning, everybody. Disappointing not to see we back. Fabulous to see man of mine. I was getting all fluttery. Anybody look back at Manham on the, on after, after we passed it? Did anybody take photographs looking back? Yes. Yeah, well, not just the sunset. When you look back at Manham Island, I was talking about the the pinnacle that um, is called Yabu, the, the spirit of Manham Island. When you look back, have a look at your photo. Good look at your photographs. On the left hand side as the island goes up about five eighths of the way up you'll see a little pimple sticking up. Yeah. That little pimple's about 200 foot of vol solid volcanic rock. That's a plug that's there. And that's the spirit of Yabu, which you couldn't see from the other side. And when you sail from Bogia uh, in, out to Manam, every time you go out, you see that spirit of Manam, uh, Yabu up there. And they maintain that if that ever fell down, the island would be destroyed. Volcanologists say there's enough power to knock that over, the island would be destroyed. Anyway, back to where we're at today. Final presentation for me, folks. And uh, as you can hear, my cold isn't any better, but I'll get to I'll get there. We're talking about artifacts and architecture and this is just a, um, a small example of the uh, artifacts that we kept. Um, when we came down from, uh, from Papua New Guinea we realised that a lot of the stuff that we had was perishable, there was a, a big hooli wig and a whole pile of other things and we thought well we could look after it, we didn't have air conditioning and everything else. And um, we were living in Adelaide and the temperature was going up and down like a yo-yo. So we actually decided to donate all of our artefacts except a few chosen ones that, that we hung on to, to the Darwin Museum. Um, they were on display there for some time. By the way, we've got a very, very good tax deduction if anybody's got any artefacts. <laughs> um, and. Um, they were on display in Darwin for quite some time and then they changed their theme and uh, they're currently in storage. In Papua New Guinea they've had a lot of trouble with the museum in Port Moresby and a lot of the smaller artefacts have suddenly grown legs and disappeared. And um, so what I intend to do is quieten down quite a bit now, they've got a really good director there now. What I intend to do is ask the Darwin Museum to deaccession my collection and send it back to Port Moresby and hopefully fill a few gaps that have, were created before. So if anybody's out there has got lots of artifacts and they want to send them back to PNG, I'm sure they'll be delighted to take them. Just the, the, the Keener shell is a very, very important piece, obviously the currency is named the Kina. And this is, this is what a, a Kina shell looks like in the raw, uh, calcified outside. Um, the, the, these, these shells here um, would be nine inches in diameter roughly. And what they do is they, they, they you would assume when you pick up an, uh, an oyster shell or whatever, you see the nice mother of pearl inside, you would assume that that's the bit that they display. Well, if they did that, they would have this cup. It wouldn't fit around the chest, flat around the chest. It would actually stick up because it's concave. So that's the inside of the shell, but this is the outside of the shell. So they have to take all of this calcification off the shell to end up with this beautiful keener that they wear. And as I say, it sits flat over the, well, it's concaved over the chest. And that's the, the, little, the little one that Morag was wearing the other day. I, um, has Keith here? I don't know whether he's here, but Keith was telling me that in the late 50s, early 60s, they shipped crate loads of 
these shells up to Mendy to help pay for the roads and things like that. Well, in 1974, I happened to be doing a stop take in the government store and I came across one of these crates that he hadn't actually emptied. So I had them put it on a plane and send it out to Como and I used it to pay for roads. <laughs> so we're doing the same thing 20 years apart. And the main reason that I did it was because down in the Basavi area uh, where, the, where the Kina shell is more valuable the rarer they, they are, all the old men had all the money and all the power. And because they had all the money and all the power, they got all the women. They were able to pay the bride price. And the young guys, you know, they were really struggling to get a wife. The older men, you know, might have six, seven, eight wives. And unfortunately, a lot of these wives that they had were very, very young girls. And it was a case of trying to break this nexus. There was a lot of, a lot of girls getting underage, not underage, but very young girls getting pregnant and, and having real problems because of their physical size. So I took a whole heap of these shells with me to pay for some road works to be done. I'm not talking about, you know, the end one. We're talking about a track that possibly a motorbike could get along to do these works and cut down a few trees and things like that. To pay the young lads in these shells so that they could then get themselves a bride and what but what I did in con consultation with the with the villagers was to say when you pay for your bride and you get your bride wait until she's had in, in, in pidgin English a, a woman's first period is Mooney come up and I said well wait until 12 moon you come up Purple and only come up penis, him now, Mary go they go one time you. So I had to wait until this the young girls were at least mature enough to even consider bearing a child. So it, we, that, that I think worked out reasonably well. But um, when we were in Alato, they were talking about the Kundu Canoe Festival. Well, here we have a, a Kundu, and um, this skin, snake skin, no, it's not a snake skin, it's a goanna, big goanna skin, and that'd be 40 centimetres um, wide, the skin. So we're talking about a big big steer here, and these are, are um, wax from a, a stingless bee, beeswax, and they're used to tune, tune the drum. And this, I, I, I was given the kundu without the skin. I thought, well, that's pretty good. Here's silent drumming. <laughs> and um, we're carrying it back to on patrol. We came to the village and this gentleman here came out of the house and he had the skin. I said, oh, well, how'd you like to put the skin on the drum? He said, no problem. Then he, uh, he disappeared for about 20 minutes with this can you can, might see down here. And um, he went into the bush and he came back with it. What are you doing? He said, oh, this is the glue. So he got a sap of a tree. I'd like to find out what the tree is because he put the sap around the rim of the, the um, kundu. Then he put the skin on the top, bound it with some bamboo, and then hit it down with the flat of his hand to tie it onto the drum. Another piece of bamboo, hit it down. And slowly, slowly, it ended up with that depth of bamboo. He said, leave it on for a couple of weeks and you'll be right. Two weeks later, took it off. It's still there. Forty years later, it's still stuck to the drum. So if there's any chemists here, I can tell you where the village is. You want to find the tree and make a fortune from superglue. I tell you. <laughs> the type of artifacts that, 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 um, that they have up in the highlands, well, this is a, a uh, a hooli pick, um, and it, it's the, the tip of the pick, this here, is this, which is actually the toenail of a cassowary. So they, um, they use that. Now, you would assume, you know, well it's like an axe, they use it for an axe. Well it's not, it's actually a defensive weapon, because in, in this particular area a lot of the fighting is done in huge trenches. 
they dig these big trenches or called barracks to, to delineate the land. And um, what tends to happen is everybody ends up, after they finish shooting arrows at each other, they end up inside these trenches chasing each other with knives and, and um, arrows and things. And these picks are designed as a defensive weapon, so when you're running away from somebody, you actually throw it back behind you. And you can imagine, that's why it's curved like this. And you can imagine that actually hitting the soft stomach. It certainly do a fair bit of damage. But to give you an idea of what um, a group of, of uh, Papua New Guineans looks like when it's on the move, this is a, uh, the type of thing that the hoolies would do if they were chasing after you. As you can see, there's not enough room to actually shoot an arrow in there, but there's certainly enough room to give you a whack on the head with something. This was taken on uh, Independence Day anniversary celebrations. And you get a whole, if you get a lot of hoolies together, there's a tendency for them to disappear somewhere and all of a sudden, <laughs> out they come, fighting the living daylights out of them. But there's another, again, handicrafts here. There's a, this is manufacturing, making a billum. You've seen the string bags. I got a, quite a surprise um, in Medang. I stopped to have a chat with a lady who was dressed in a prison warders uniform. I don't know whether any of you saw her there, but just a kind of drab khaki type uniform, long dress and the shirt. And I asked her if she borrowed the uniform from somebody. And she said, no, no, no. I said, what do you know? She said, oh, me look out in Calibus Mary. And she was actually supervising three prisoners, female prisoners, who had made the string bags. So part of their, their rehabilitation was to make the string bags to sell in the markets. And she was down supervising them. And, um, one of them is, is it Bruce, Brian Nemis, is he in the audience? No? She said, oh, you saw me long, Brian Nemis or not? <coughs> yeah, yeah, he's on the ship. Oh, we like looking at Lorna. She was a little child when, when he and his wife were, were around in Manang, and she wanted to catch up with him. So I said, how long have you been in jail? She said, three years. I said, oh, yeah. not much to go to, maybe two more. So I took her hand and I looked at her and I went, don't do it again. <laughs> but um, all these bowls and the like you see, when you go to the, the markets, you might think that they're, they're made on lathes or some sort of machinery that's being used to, to manufacture them, but they're not. They're all handmade. And um, they, generally they used to use shells, but this guy's got a, a very, um, strong piece of bed spring that he's bent and sharpened to, uh, to create the, the tool, digging tool with and then Again, there's billums. Now you would have seen baskets in, in, uh, in Medang. These, these are, this is made in Ombuka and Bougainville. But the, the intricacy and the, the craftsmanship in these things is something you really need to take a look at. It's not just something with a bit of bamboo tied around it or whatever, you actually have a good look and you'll be surprised at the dexterity that's needed to create these things. This is a, a shield from uh, Simbai up in behind um, Medang and it, it's been used as a, an arrowhead in there and a couple more, I think there's one in there as well. But that shield is about, I don't know, maybe four foot two or three off the ground, and maybe a couple of feet wide. And there's a, there's a rope here and here, which goes out the other side. And they carry it over the shoulder, and they stand and shoot an arrow. And then when somebody shoots one back, they can actually hide their entire body behind it, which is pretty good. <coughs> this is tarpa cloth. People who have been to Fiji would have probably bought some tarpa cloth. I didn't see any at the markets. But this is quite thick, but the, the, and the quality, quite frankly, is a lot better than 
a bit of Fiji and stuff, we can run for the land. She's not going to come and eat me or something. But um, if you get to see any tarpa cloth anywhere on your travel, it's well worth having a look and maybe making a purchase. The types of weapons, all of these artifacts were given to me. You know, like, like, these are the ones I selected to hang on to. Um, I was given this, this lump of rock with a hole in it. I thought, how, the, how long must it have taken to actually make the hole in the rock without the rock breaking? And then to put the bamboo, bind the bamboo around here. And that was put on wet. And then it, as it as dried out, it compressed. But then, sufficiently enough bamboo, the same sort of thing up the top, to hold it in. Because you can imagine that, that, that thing weighs about two and a half kilos. And then you, you're doing that, you don't want to come off. Because the guy behind you's got one of these. Now this is a, again, it's all, all handmade. And it takes forever to shape these things. And um, you can see the quite a sharp tip. Now this is from the Enya area. You will see them with a with a, a much bigger bulb at the back there. And that's from Mount Hagen. But then the, the whole variety of arrows that you'll see the this particular one here. This is black palm, and um, you, you can't see from the image, but the the, the arrowhead had three grooves in it with a very, very fine point. And you can see down here, it's, it's um, bamboo's fastened it to this piece of the shaft of the, of the arrow of bamboo. Now, th that particular arrow is used for killing people. It's, it's, yeah, you can use it for hunting, but it's not all that efficient. But what they do is they um, tip the, um, the arrow with a bit of excreta, or some, something nasty. Not such thing as poison, but something that's going to create a problem. And when, it doesn't matter how far that arrow penetrates, the shaft of the arrow is so much heavier than the tip that when it goes in, the back end wobbles like this. So however deep it goes into the, into the body, inside it's like a dum-dum bullet just carving away. But also the tip fragments. So you end up with lots of little um, splinters inside. So again, septicemia is probably one of the biggest killers. In the Basavi, they tip the arrows with um, uh, wallaby bones or occasionally possum. And these are designed so that when they actually penetrate, usually pig or cassowary, that the arrow falls out and they don't have to make another one. And, and the tip stays in, but it acts like a, a hypodermic noodle or a hypodermic needle. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, it allows for, for blood to actually come out of the, the animal. And then the dogs are able to follow the blood and track it, track it down and they can kill it. But this particular arrow here, um, you can see they've spent a lot of time in decoration, that string that they make with the billings. This is a very, very fine string that they've made here. It's obviously designed so the thing doesn't come off. But, but the edges of those, are, they're like as sharp as you can be. You, know, you can shave with these things. This is bamboo. And at the tip of the bamboo, that's where the joins are. You know the bamboo, you've got the joins of the bamboo. Well, that's where they get the strength from in, in the end there. And sometimes I'll put it in the fire just to give it that extra extra bit of strength. But um, of all the artifacts I got in, in Papua New Guinea, this one is my favorite. It's a simple little bowl. Not the Holy Grail, folks. Don't worry, it didn't come out to Papua New Guinea. But um, this is from Manham Island. And you can see that's when it was given to me, the, the uh, chief, the cooker either, gave it to me. He went through the genealogy of the people who actually owned the bowl and who made the bowl. And it worked out about 400 years old by the time he finished. Now you might see here they've got these grooves. And you think, oh, you know, they look as though they've been made by a, 
a knife or some sharp in instrument. They're actually put in there with the, the tail of a stingray. And the stingray's tail is like a, an abrophile and it's very, um, very sharp when they put it through, so they, they use that for filing. Now those people that have been to Papua New Guinea, I'm not asking you this question, I'm asking the people that haven't been to Papua New Guinea, what do you think that is? It's a pillow. <laughs> That's a pillow, and it's again, it's from Manum Island. You can see the distinct Manum Island mask faces here. But that's a, a traditional pillow. These were made up in, in uh, the Southern Highlands. We, we actually got napkin rings made. I mean, generally, they're a big, a big band that fits around the arm. So we just asked them to make them a lot smaller so we could put napkins in them. And that's a traditional comb, just made from bamboo. But again, it, this is a, a Manum Island mask. You know, the Sepik, similar long nose, very phallic. Um, but this is from, from Manum. This particular uh, item is from Wuvalu. And if we'd gone into Wewak, hopefully there would have been Wuvalu carvings there. And it's brilliant, the, the timber that they use there, they call it paraffin wood, I've got no idea what it is. But the sharks and the dolphins and all the carvings that they make on Wuvalu Island are absolutely exquisite. So if you happen across something from Wuvalu Island, it doesn't matter how much it costs, grab it, you'll be, you'll be really pleased. Again, Manum Island, same little faces, this coconut bowl, would have probably been about a nine inch diameter coconut. And this is a cassowary femur dagger. And when we're in the southern high, well, in the Mendy area, and as I showed you on the previous uh, presentation, the, the Hoolies men use it as a part of their initiation and it's part of their dress. And um, uh, part of our job was to actually get them to blunt the tip and make that rounded. Because it was like a Scotsman wearing a ski and do. You know, you got a ski and do and you know, you turn around and say, look, you can't have a sharp ski and do. I mean, but what, that's what we did. We said, you can't have a sharp uh, dagger. You can carry the dagger, it's all part of your dress, not a problem, but don't have a sharp one. So they blunted the ends off there, made them rounded. And then when they um, cleaned the shaft off here, they extended this part here. They didn't, they didn't go right down to here. They actually got about here. And so that's all hollow. And they roll up their banknotes and they push it into there. So that's their little wallet and they carry that around in their, in their waist, waistband. And that's just a collection of, um, of little artifacts that we've got. This presentation was supposed to have happened when the last presentation was on. The one with all the sing-sings, that was supposed to be today. But there was a little bit of confusion in the printing of the program, so we just switched them over. Had this gone in the right direction, I would have been telling you, when we're in WeWAC, look out for these. Because these are traditional carvings and when you saw the, the Sing Sing dancers with the great big feathered headdresses, well, that's what these represent. The, that's the strangest artifact I've ever seen. <laughs> that, that's a, like a kangaroo, that cat, and that huge back legs and little short front ones. But it's a typical thing. Occasionally, you'd go into a village and they'd decide to put on a little bit of a, a uh, role play for you. And the guys would come out and they'd show you how they make fire and do things. So they, um, and the Aborigines got a piece of hardwood, a piece of softwood, some kindling, and they rub it like this. These guys, a lot easier. Strip of bamboo, very strong on the outside, very soft on the inside. Just again like an abrophile. Bit of kapok seed in there. Seconds later, you can have a smoke. But, here we go, this is where all the work's really done. 
they say that the, the billings, you know, are huge when they they can extend to, to quite a quite a, a um, quite a size. One of the things that that you know, if you meet an older lady and um, you can strike up a conversation with her, just ask her politely if you're able to run your hand over the top of the head and you'll find that there's actually a groove, especially up in the highlands. The, the kids have been wearing them since they were five, six, seven years of age and their skull forms and they end up with a groove in the, the top of the head with a billum, they carry in the billum. This is uh, my friend Hoggagol, the man with eight wives and um, Again, we'll just highlight the bird of paradise that I showed you in the previous presentation. That's the ruffle on the back of the superb bird of paradise, and that's the bow tie. So when you watch David Attenborough again, that's where the bird ends up. There's a typical day wig in, in the, the Huli area. These are all everlasting daisies. This snake skin is very typical of all of the headdresses they wear. And that's a Papua New Guinea independence logo that he's wearing. The um, significance of a, a lot of these things, this is the sugar glider tail there. But these two white bits here are actually the scrotum of a possum. And um, I don't know whether it helps his hearing, but you know. <laughs> but this is the Sakina shell. And then these black bands uh, quills from a cassowary. So they've got the quills and they just push one inside the other and, and create the thing. And, and if, they, if they're fortunate enough to have a friend that works in the garage, they get a couple of brass nuts or steel nuts that they pinch from somewhere, <laughs> whack it up the end and screw it in tight so it doesn't fall off. So very, very versatile and pragmatic. And this is a holy shilling that Morag had on her, her necklace is holy shilling there, so I won't call the hoolies peacocks there, but it's a paradise, not peacocks. Typical sight in a, in a village market, you'll find somebody that's um, playing his pan flute, and they're not actually playing a tune, it's just, it's just the, the various tones that the, the pipes make, and they wander around playing it and saying hello, but this guy's got a, a few bits of uh, electrical cable that he's using for decoration. And um, again, it's a, a bamboo pipe. And this, this guy's found somewhere to, to keep his ear at his uh, safety pin. <laughs> I say the, the billings, a, a, a lady from the Chinmu area, she's got uh, facial tattoos. Uh, Markings. But here we have the, the Huli ladies, and as I say, here's a Lidley there, she'd be, I don't know, maybe six years of age, already carrying a fairly decent sized billet. But there, every single one of them has got a billet on the head. The architecture in Papua New Guinea it, it is quite amazing. I mean, we have to remember. You know, Aboriginal pe people say they've got a 40,000, 50,000 year history or whatever. Papua New Guineans have been around just as long and they've created an architecture that is relevant to their, their individual climates. And um, one of the roles that we had to do was to create this modern piece of architecture in every village. So that's the long drop. Not a nail in sight. Thank goodness, I want to sit on it. This is a, a, a men's house on Manham Island. And just to show you, the, the, um, this is a, a Garamut drum here. And that, that would be four, four foot deep. Huge logs. I think that, I think a lot of these logs actually came down the Rauru or the Sepik and they just found them because they wouldn't draw trees this size on the island. But here we've got six drums in here. One, two, three, four, five, 
as well, the next six. And this is in the, the Paramount Chief Village. And when they had a party and they fired up these drums, if the weather conditions were right, you could hear this on the mainland, 13 miles away. The sound would just travel straight across the sea. Nice flat, calm sea. And you could hear them having a party. It took a long time to get out there to join in, so there wasn't any point in going. But um, this is a, a typical coastal village house. There's a mosquito net hanging up there for somebody to have a bit of a sleep in the afternoon. They always have the kitchen outside, so if it goes on fire, it doesn't burn the rest of the place down. And there's always this outside platform, which is used for any reason sitting on, sleeping on, dogs falling asleep underneath. One thing I did see on Manham Island, in a similar sort of house to that, was a, an old lady sitting down underneath the house. And I asked the guy, I said, what you, why isn't she inside? Why is she inside? She's going to die tomorrow. Oh, that's not. No, the older ladies, or the older people, when it was time to go, they just take their little bed, their, their sleeping mat, they go down underneath the house, put that out. Day or two later, they'd be dead. They, you know, they just decide that's the end of it, and of being absolutely no use to the village, so off they go. Quite confronting to have that pointed out to you. But this, or this again in Manor Island, this is the, the Paramount Chief's house. <clears throat> and you'd have to be a paramount chief to own a place this big. But he's got, I think he had four wives in here, had an internal kitchen. And um, the way they do that is they actually make a cradle of, of logs, timber, and they put um, some river gravel or stones there, and on Manor Mine, and they've got plenty of volcanic rock they can put down the, on the base. And then they put clay on the top and then they construct the fire on the top of the clay. And as long as they keep the fire on that clay, then there's no problem as far as the house going on fire because the heat goes down through the clay into the rocks. And then because the rocks have got the gaps, it, it cools down fairly quickly. So they use the, it, in the highlands, they use it for nighttime heating. And then on the coast, it's just to dissipate that heat as much quickly as possible. But, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this is the, the chief's house, and this is the men's house right next door. And they're those garamut drums I showed you earlier. But I don't, you, you might be able to make out, I hope you can, but this pole, those faces that were carved in, this, in the spoon, all down this pole was cut completely carved with faces. So, I mean, they, they got an inordinate amount of trouble to make things really, really special for themselves. And this, it, the, the, the little black bowl I got from inside this, this building here. Up in the, the highlands, a place called, well, the finest is Tep Tep. They're totally different again. It's just like getting into an igloo. This house, sorry about the quality of the, the photograph, but it was taken, it was a snapshot taken off a screen having transferred from Super 8 video to DVD and somehow we ended up with an awful lot of blue. But there's the entrance to the house there. There's three rooms inside the house. But the walls of this building are probably a metre and a half thick. And it's just solid grass. It's piled on top. With a, with a, there's a, a wicker frame inside. But the Inside the roof here, there's a whole series of bamboo that's actually laid out, so that's got an open end right the way through. And it just with air convection, the smoke goes up into the roof, sits in the roof, and eventually percolates down through these bamboo poles. And as it comes out, just like when you're siphoning petrol, the hot air is just drawn out and the smoke is drawn out from inside the house. They're amazing structures, those, those things there. In the, uh, the Southern Highlands, this is a, a Hooli man's house. What used to happen in the past, all the men, the initiated men, 
live in their house, the women, uninitiated boys and girls live in their house and occasionally they meet in the garden. But this, um, in this particular house there's a, like a, a, a fence around the base there but they've actually dug down inside so they can stand up quite well inside but there's actually the house is more, more or less like a pit with this low roof and that's mainly for both heat uh, retaining heat during the night and um, to stop flooding into the house as well. But um, as you can see, got <coughs> oh, Hogogol is a very wealthy man. They're all individual pig's tails. Something that I, I didn't mention, I just crop come into my head whilst I'm talking about it. You see on, on his wrist there's, there's a series of bands here and here. When I actually kill a pig especially a male pig, um, and they, they've killed the pig and they're, they're cutting it up. Um, they take the, any doctors in the house, there's a urethra channel that, that goes from the testes out the penis. They take that piece and they tie it around the wrist and eventually it dries to a really black piece of, of skin uh, and around the wrist and that shows you how wealthy they are because you know that they've had to kill a very big pig to have that, that bracelet. <coughs> the younger guys used to have these black bracelets but they were going out to the 44 gallon fuel drums taking the lid off, taking the, <laughs> taking the, uh, the black uh, rubber seal off, putting that on, putting the lid back on and taking off. So we had to be very, very careful when we're getting into the avgas to fill up the planes to make sure that we checked that the bottom half of the, of the 44 gallon drum wasn't full of water because somebody had pinched the, the, uh, the rubber stopper. But they, again, what do you do with your money in Papua New Guinea? You, you haven't got wallets, you haven't got pockets to, to walk around. So you've got to hide it somewhere, keep it somewhere. Again, misinterpretation. We would talk to to the, the people and say, put your money in the bank and it will grow. You'll get interest. Well, I, and if I bury it in the garden, it will grow. Maybe. But what they would do is they would actually fill up their um, bamboo poles with the money and they'd put them up inside the roof of the house. And of course, if the house caught on fire, you ended up with this. So well, that's just a mess of, of both uh, shillings and two shilling pieces, both uh, sterling silver and cupra nickel, the whole lot. So you can imagine the heat of the fire that, that created that. <coughs> and I picked that up when we were doing, a, uh, doing the exchange program, changing the Kina and Toya, changing the dollars and cents for Kina and Toya. And this guy came up with a mourn mournful look on his face and said, you know, I think that might be ten dollars here. And I said, Well, I'm sorry, it's not really worth anything. But I gave him five bucks and kept him as a souvenir. The um, again this is in the Huli area, the Southern Highlands. This particular house was was built as part of a uh, an outdoor museum. They got very creative in the 70s, trying to leave something behind. And this particular structure, the house, the, the architecture here, 90% of the Hoolies had never seen that before in their lives before. And they came and said, what's that, what's that? And there's a, 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 a thought that um, the, the Hoolies are actually Angers who have come over the hill into the valley and the people that lived there were pushed out by these coolies coming down and they were um, uh, farmers, they uh, grew grain or grass seeds, they mortars and pestles, they made flour, they made a damper and that's the type of house they lived in. But all of that is gone and that was probably, you know, maybe 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, all of that disappeared. But down in the, the Basavi, they've got the Great Papuan Plateau. Um, 
this is the sort of house that they build there. And you know, you've got 30 odd families living there. This inside, at least 20 feet, and hanging from the ceiling on this place are the biggest barramundi skeletons you've ever seen. You've got vertebrae that big. Any fisherman around, you want to go and get a fish, go up there. They're huge fish. But there's just the skeletons hanging from the ceiling. But inside you've got a petition that runs the length of the house from about there down and one there down. And the women and the kids live on that side and the men are down either side of the centre, right down the centre of the poles that hold the roof on. And then there's a man, fire pit, man, fire pit, man, fire pit, all the way down the house. And and um, inside the house is, is big enough to have their, their sing-sings and their, their uh, initiation ceremonies and the like. And in this particular area, um, they've got, I, mean, I, I told you before about the hoolies with the shiny skin and they put a tree oil on it. They get it from this area here. And what they do is they get like a, a pandanus, like a pandanus cone, and they collect the oil or the sap from the tree in the pandanus cone. And, um, and just hang it up and it eventually solidifies and they use it for trading up into the uh, southern highlands where they then it's then reheated and melted and then they put it on as a body decoration or they use it as a torch when they set fire at the end and they carry the torch to light the way around well in when they're having the ceremonies and here initiation of the young boys they're dancing inside the house and they're, they're all animists and so they're singing about the bushes and the rivers and the streams and the birds and all the rest of it and they work themselves into a, a bit of a trance and as they're dancing around they see their mothers and the mothers have got a couple of these torches and we're talking about molten lit molten rosin and they see their mothers and they rush across to their mothers and grab their mothers and their mothers take these two torches, lit torches, and throw them behind them and stub them out onto the shoulders and the backs of these young lads. And that immediately brings them out of the trance that they were in. And they rush across to the dance and the dads get handfuls of ash from the fire and rub those over the blisters that have been created by the, the molten rosin. And then they get back into the dance again get themselves into another trance. In the meantime, mum's gone off and lit these two torches again. She's standing there waiting for the next time. So three or four times they'll rush to their mothers and the mothers will stuff these torches over the back. Consequently, on the backs of these people and, and from the dripping, burning sap that runs down their arms, they end up with these keloid scars all across their backs not unlike the, the ones that, the, um, that they do in, um, in Weewak and the sea pig where they scarify the skin. But this is the type of, of dance that they would normally do inside the house. Um, as you can see, the, the headdress again is very reminiscent of the Torres Strait Island red headdress. But at the back here, there's a large tail that's been constructed and affixed to the end of the tail a whole pile of, of freshwater crayfish claws and as they dance these things rattle and bounce around but you can imagine these two were getting ready for initiation inside the house dancing around doing that and the next thing that happens they end up I mean this is this is delicate work that's been done on this woman's chest nothing delicate about the scars on the backs of these, these young men. But this is the, another house in a different area. Um, but just to give you an idea, that that is this house. And that there is the patrol officer's house. And we're talking about a reasonable size house, two or three rooms, kitchen and the like. So you can see there's a huge difference in the sizes and the the number of people that can actually stay in there. But I, I made my own contribution to, to
to Papua New Guinea's architecture everywhere we went. We uh, spent 50 bucks and built a house with. So uh, we always had one of these in our garden. Nice to go and sit down and have a quiet drink and of an evening. And um, that's uh, the Papua New Guinea Valley Hut. And we've got one of these in our front garden in, in Brisbane. And we've gone sit and rest and recuperate. We remember one of the early slides I showed you the picture of them crossing the string bridge. Well things progressed in Papua New Guinea and this is the construction of a Bailey bridge in Tari and it's all done by hand. There's no machinery there, nobody's all the timber was flown in by Hercules. The only F, the only help they got was to actually shift it from the airstrip to the bridge site on the the back of a, a trailer a tractor. But Bailey Bridge is designed so that you construct it like Meccano, push it over the river, it's counterbalanced at one end, keep pushing it, keep pushing it, counterbalanced. At one end of the bridge they've got all these 44 gallon drums full of water, timber, everything else just to keep that balance and slowly, slowly, slowly move it across the river. <coughs> Here's the supervisor there. Um, and they just pull it across and drop it into these guides here. Obviously somebody stepped off the bridge at the other end just then. But um, as you can see, they're getting across and it's all done by manpower. Eventually, it was dropped down and because because it's balanced this is the bridge here one side of the river is here the other side's here this is the counterbalance once it's over and settled <coughs> they actually take this bit off and bolt it onto the other piece and that doubles the strength a single like that single there would be like a five ton bridge they actually bolt the other steel onto the outside edge and they end up with a 10 ton bridge. Well that's it for the now folks. Possibly a little later on there might be a DVD being shown called Kiat, the story behind the medal. Um, in um, 2013 the, the government in their wisdom after a lot of work from a few key apps to get recognition from the work that we've done in Papua New Guinea, um, they decided to give us a, uh, a police overseas service medal, which was issued in, in uh, July, I think it was, 2013. So if any of you know any former patrol officers or families of, of patrol officers who have passed on, ask them if they're going to put in a, a posthumous um, application for the medal. We really do need to have everybody that was there recognised with this medal. So <laughs> there may be, no promises, this DVD a little bit later on. That's it for me, folks.